Why did you join the Air Force? Wanted money for school. Okay. Uh, I worked at a job that I didn't enjoy. I wanted to do something that I love for a living. And I felt that joining the military would help me get a chance to go to school but not have to pay for it. Yeah, because so, yes. you get tuition assistance while you're in and yeah. then you knew about the GI Bill and all that when you were coming in. You knew that- I didn't know about the GI Bill. So you just thought they would pay for school while you were in. Yeah. You didn't know that they were going to pay for it after you got no, out. No, I didn't. No. Dang. So you actually got way more than you were yeah. bargaining for <laughs> in the first place. Yeah. You were like, this is sweet. <laughs> and it was a Marine that taught me into going, that I worked with and taught me into going into the Air Force, into the military in general, but into the Air Force. Okay, and all the military branches are going to have the GI Bill and, and tuition assistance, a DOD-wide thing. So yeah. um, that's not Air Force specific, but he was recommending the Air Force for what reason, since he was a Marine. Did he tell you why? He knew that I had a family and I was a little older going in, so he was like, it would probably be more stable for you and your family, you know, you get to spend more time with them as opposed to if you join the Marines, then you could be shipped off. In his opinion, that the Air Force had better housing. He just felt like they had more to offer than the Marines. Yeah. And that's not me, Air Force talking down the Marines. This is coming I'm, from the I'm going to say that is probably true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just from my experience talking with a bunch of other people and, and being in other bases and stuff while I was in for six years is the Air Force definitely seems to have things a lot more figured out as far as the family life goes so that I wouldn't say is necessarily untrue there will be bases that maybe aren't as good I think overall if you're doing as the Air Force is a whole thing I think overall you're gonna have a lot better lifestyle so how long were you in the Air Force for and what rank did you make I was in for about three years I was an A1C and I got out probably a couple of weeks before I would put on senior airman Okay, so you were in E3 and got out right before you would have put on E4. Yeah. So this is going to be what the whole video topic is going to be about. What exactly was the title of your job and what was that AFSC? The title of my job was Non-Destructive Inspections 2A7X2. Involved with inspecting the aircraft but not destroying it to inspect it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you want to... Oversimplify it. We're gonna we're gonna get more into that towards the end of this interview. So yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna save that. Where okay. You, where you actually explain all the little things you did, or maybe the different sections. Or different oh, okay, ways. cool. So when you joined the Air Force, did you come in as an open contractor? Did you have NDI right away? NDI is non-destructive inspection, just shortened. That's what people call it in the Air Force. But did you get that job specifically in depth? Or did you join with an open contract and then how long of a contract did you sign? I joined with an open contract and okay. I got the job later. I signed initially for four years. Okay, so you signed a four-year open mechanical when you came in. Yeah. And then they gave you NDI at, at, at BMT. At BMT, yeah. Was NDI something that you wanted to do when you were initially joining? When you were looking into first joining, when you're like, oh, I'm going to go for school, were you like, ooh, NDI looks really good? Or were you just kind of open-minded or did you have anything specific? Like, what did you want to do? Initially, I wanted to do air traffic control, but it, they just didn't have any openings at the time. And like I said, my recruiter was like, you need to take open mechanical or you're not going to be going. So yeah. I took open mechanical. In doing so, I started doing research on NDI because people I was in debt with kept talking about NDI, how yeah. cool it was. And in doing my research, I was like, yeah, this doesn't look bad. So. so once you found out your job in basic training because you signed the open contract, you were going to be headed to tech school. Where was your tech school and how long was it? My tech school was in Pensacola, Florida, and it was actually on a Navy base. NAS Pensacola, the Navy base, and it's shared with Navy, Marines, and Air Force. Yep. I loved it there, by the way. I think it was from two or three months long. You said you enjoyed it. Yeah. So you want to know something funny, as you probably already knew this. I was in tech school at the same place. So it just hit me. I went to tech school <laughs> at NAS Pensacola as well because I was sheet metal. I was aircraft structural maintenance, which is That's right. 2A7X3. Okay. So you're 2A7X2, and we're like the next AFSC up. Uh -huh. So it doesn't mean we're like above them. It just means like we're all in a, a, a string of order. Like we all work together basically. So 2A7X, we all are like very similar jobs in a way. So. Yours was ending with two, mine ended with three, and then I think Metals Tech might end with one or four. I can't remember what it was. All these jobs that work all together, but at NAS Pensacola, it was NDI, low observable structural maintenance, and mm -hmm. then it was aircraft structural maintenance. Yeah. So we had those three career fields there, and you said you loved it. I absolutely loved it. Well, actually, I'll throw up a clip kind of to sum up how tech school was for me. When did you go? What months? Um, it was during the cold months. Ooh, that sucks. But it was still fun. December through, I think, February. Okay, so I got there in March, and I left in June. 
mm -hmm. and it was beautiful. Now, keep in mind, there's only three jobs that go to that base. Don't expect that when you go to tech school, your life is gonna be like that. We just got very lucky. Also, do not just join a job because <laughs> right. of where tech school is. Right, right, right. Because your job can go anywhere, yeah. right? So it's not like you're like, well, you went to tech school in Florida and then you got stationed in Florida. You're looking at, you could go to Minot. Why not? You could, <laughs> you could, like, that's like the first thing that comes to everybody's mind. You're like, no, why not? Yeah. So you could go to North Dakota, right? Yeah. You know, and you'd be like, but I signed because I got three months in Pensacola. And now I have four years in North Dakota, yeah, it's you know, not so, worth it. so I wouldn't base anything off of just like where your tech school is, but yeah, our, we were pretty lucky with where our tech school was. So I know we kind of just talked about getting stationed at places we said might not, and then you've been stationed at Tyndall. Where all can NDI go? Is there like, is it like limited to a few bases or can you go like everywhere or what's like the limitations really? I think NDI can go pretty much anywhere, but it depends on the jet that you get attached to. Mm -hmm. So like my, I went to Tyndall and I was attached to the F-22. So were they actually, did they attach you to the 22? So you could yes. only- They can still take me and, or whoever that is a, or attached to the F-22 and put you somewhere else, mm -hmm. but they try to keep you yeah. with the F-22, F-22 if you start on the F-22. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, so like my experience was totally opposite of that because I was just on a regular old airframe. I was on the F-15s at first. And then they moved me to the HH-60 helicopters at my next base. Yeah. So, which both of those aren't like this crazy new technology or anything. So maybe that had anything to do with like, just like the amount of newness to it is like, they're kind of like, well, we want that, that experience yeah. to stay with the aircraft. So you could go pretty much anywhere there's aircraft, essentially, yeah. as NDI. Yeah, pretty okay. much. One of the questions I was gonna ask at the very end, but I'm just gonna ask it now, because we already know the answer is, well, were you gonna make the Air Force a career? I never had intentions <laughs> on making the Air Force a career, no. So, and you're, you're currently out. How long have you been out? Almost two years, well, like a year and a half. Okay, so definitely not making it a career. No. I was just going to say that to the end and I'm like, might as well get it out of the way now. <laughs> but this, this is the biggest question of the whole interview that we're going to do about your job, NDI. Can you explain to somebody that might have no idea or might be interested in this job possibly, and they've just seen the short description that's on the Air Force website of what exactly do you do in your job? Because I'm sure what you've learned in your three years of doing it was probably a lot more in depth than what you had read online. What like different sections can you maybe be stationed in or different jobs or duties can you get in your career field? And what do you guys do on like a daily basis? I will say that NDI is one of the few jobs that the description pretty much is, is accurate. Okay. It's like- Well, that's good to know. It's good to know. A lot of, yeah, a lot of descriptions you read it and you're like, there's no way that's what it's like. And then you get in, you're like, yeah, that, it wasn't like that at all. If you read the NDI description and you're like, what is this? And you're confused, that's what you're gonna be doing in NDI. We use different methods to test the jet and to see if it has cracks in the jet. Because you know, when you're flying, you have a lot of force and pressure mm -hmm. on the aircraft. And so it can get cracks and that can be detrimental. So you wanna find them and get sheet metal or someone else yeah. to you know we would, fix, we would fix everything so basically we give everybody else work and that's yeah. why nobody liked NDI um, and it takes because you tell everybody everything's broken <laughs> we tell everybody was broken and they have to do work and they would have to stay late and yeah they hate you one way to find cracks is through x-rays we would x-ray the aircraft. And you would do the entire aircraft sometimes you do sections of the aircraft. okay so you do like a wing or something like that yes exactly okay. you do a wing or you do like the bottom of it and i know that's not the correct term i can't remember yeah. the correct term for the bottom of the aircraft but um you would do that and it's kind of dangerous so they actually call us the cancer job i think that's something that's very I mean, important. All maintenance is cancer jobs. True. Like, all maintenance. Because isn't the LO stuff like... Oh, LO is like super bad for you. Yeah. Like really bad. We shoot unshielded x-rays. So if you go to the doctor, you notice that the nurse or doctor or whatever or go behind a little thing and they shoot your x-ray mm -hmm. and it's like lead plated. Yeah. Um, when you shoot x-rays on the aircraft, it's unshielded. So you have to hit the button for it to do its thing and you have to run and you have to get a certain distance away and use a survey to make sure you're not in the radiation area. Yeah. It's like pretty dangerous. So. You know what's funny? <laughs> we were, okay, this isn't funny at all, but when I was in Japan, there was a call over the radio one night. We were waiting on a Friday night. For some reason, they always want to do x-rays on Friday nights yeah. <laughs> in the evening when we're trying to go home and they're like, nobody could go home until the x-ray was done and they got everything cleared up. Yeah. 
and like everything put away. So we're like waiting on them, and then like comes out of the radio and was like, uh, yeah, can we get somebody down here? Uh, I've been radiated, and I'm like, bro, <laughs> like you gotta be kidding me, man. Yeah. You're like, well, that dude might not be able to have kids anymore or something. Yeah. And you're just like, so, but like they had to go to the hospital and then get tested. And, like we didn't have to wait for that. Like they like took the dude to the hospital. Yeah, it was a big deal um, because that person wasn't paying attention because you guys set cones up around. Yeah, you set up cones. The up. outside of the uh, hangar that yeah. you're doing it in. And some like crew chief just like straight up walked through it oh, like, up man. to the aircraft. And they were like, what are you doing? And so, and it literally there's like signs that say like yeah. x-ray in process. And some people are just like, they're not paying attention. So you're like, dude. But yeah, I, I say it's funny, but it's really not because yeah. that, that person <laughs> is probably like lifelong consequences from that. Possibly, hopefully not. Yeah, definitely like uh, can be scary, but yeah, it can yeah be. I didn't mess with it. When you saw cones and said x-ray in process, I was like, bro, I'm, I'm out. Yeah. I didn't go near it. If you don't pay attention to anything else in the Air Force, don't break red and don't walk through those cones if it says <laughs> x-ray process. So, yeah. Other than the x-rays, like what are some other things that you'll do with your job? Penetrant was another method that we used and it's like this glow in the dark type material and you put it on where you think a suspected crack would be and it seeps into the crack and so we use a black light and you shine it on it and if you see it like it'll make the crack the crack glow mm -hmm. so pretty simple but yeah that's another method that we use magna particle was another method that we use we have this huge magnifying machine thingy and you put these uh this liquid on it and this liquid has like little particles of medical metal in it and so if you think about it if you have a crack in something, it splits the the part into poles, like a north and south pole, like a magnet. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So because it splits it, the little metal particles will find the, the crack and they will attach there. And it'll glow. It's, it's all glowing. It's all under a huge black light. So that, it's all little, like, little scientific stuff like that in NDI. And sometimes... You know, a lot of people say NDI is easy, which it is for the most part, but sometimes you can get a night where I can't think of which job, but they may bring you like two or three hundred bolts that you have to do. You have to do them like one at a time. Sometimes or like, you where you dip them and then let them sit and then you have to inspect them all. Yeah. 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 So it can be tedious jobs like that. Welcome to the other maintenance jobs in the Air Force <laughs> where we actually have constant work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so, and there's something else that you didn't mention, eddy current. Yeah, you didn't talk about that. So uh, the reason I know is because, like he was saying earlier, they find the cracks and they tell us to do the work. Like he was being like, yeah, they bring us all these bolts so we had to work. They would find all these cracks so then we had to work. Like that's kind of how it was. Yeah. So eddy current was a major thing that was used yeah. so, for when I would work with people. I'm glad you said that because that's one that I make and explain the best without sounding like an idiot because it's been so long. But, <laughs> um, Eddy current, it's like this little pin, like a metal pin, and it's attached to this machine that gives you like re readings and readouts. Mm -hmm. And when you put it on there, you scan it across. And so if you think about it, a crack, if you have a, a flush metal surface and you have a crack, that crack is going to have air in it. So it's putting out these like electronic pulses and it will pick up on the air that that crack has in it. Gotcha. It'll give you a spike. So it's spike. like bouncing like from the metal back. Yeah. So if it hits a crack, it'll make like a deeper bounce, basically. Yeah, pretty much. I actually learned how to do this a little bit. And so like when you guys would do it, you would like move the pen back and forth over a spot and it would just keep creating a line going like this. And then if there was a crack, it would go like this. Yeah. So then you would have like a line that was like flat, like it was showing like the like level of the metal. And then all of a sudden you just have these like random jagged yeah. spikes yeah. so then they could tell where the crack was and you have to adjust the pin and for different metals because different metals are composed different mm -hmm. so it, it would have to to uh penetrate the metal differently it would have to be set differently because yeah. it would have to you know penetrate it differently and i know there's an ndi expert that's like he didn't get everything 100 percent right but dude it's been a long time okay <laughs> We're just giving you a general, general sense of what's going on. So jumps is something else we do in NDI. You know a lot about NDI, dude. Yeah. That's... I, I worked with NDI guys, so. Wow. Yeah. Um, so pretty much, the air, if you think about the aircraft and it's flying or whatever, and it can get wear metals in the oil. And so we take an oil sample. They, I forget which job brings us the oil sample. Crew chiefs. 
Crew Treat, yeah, Crew Treats yeah. bring us the oil samples and we put it into this machine. We take a little cat food, we put it in this machine uh, with an electrode and it spins like a million miles an hour and it reads all the wear metals, all the materials that are in that oil. And there should be a certain amount of certain things in the oil. And I cannot, can you remember? I hate to ask somebody that's not oh, ABI. Like not magnesium or something. Magnesium is yeah. one. Um, like copper or zinc or something. Maybe. You should do an NDI video. I, I, <laughs> so I, I actually helped a guy do it one time. I didn't know anything I was doing though uh, when I was TDY that I was like helping him do it. Yeah. And so the way he explained it was like your car, right? When your car needs an oil change, when you drain it, there's a bunch of little like bits of metal and stuff like dust, metal dust in your oil. Yeah. And that's why it gets dirty. And so when you change it out and you put new oil in, is what that's kind of what you guys test for too yeah. is to be like because you can actually tell what components are wearing down that's the thing so yeah. certain certain elements shouldn't be reading too high and i think one of the biggest things on the f-22 was titanium we really yeah. always look for titanium yeah so if titanium you have a book to go by um to yeah you have yeah. your to to go by and if titanium is above a level five then you know that this aircraft something is going wrong with it could be like the engine or something or yeah. there's a specific part of the aircraft that is going bad because it'll give you a high reading in so, that. so you're kind of like the electronic like diagnostics thing like on a car when people yeah. plug it in it tells them the codes back yeah it's kind of what you're doing except you're testing the oil and then it's telling you what parts are being worn essentially because yeah. you're like well this part is this metal so that could be the only thing in the whole engine compartment or anything that touches this oil what parts that touch the oil are this yeah. compound. Yeah. And so then you can kind of be aware of like, we need to change this part out or let them know so they can keep an eye on it or yeah. change it before it completely goes bad. Yeah. So I thought that was really cool because I was like, dude, I, don't, like, I wish cars did that too. Like people could be like, oh yeah, the transmission's going <laughs> yeah. This is going out or that is because they know what metals are being worn. Yeah. But I think it would be way too expensive <laughs> to do on a car. But Because I'm sure those machines that you guys put the oil in are like ridiculously expensive. Yeah. And it's cool because you have the power to, well, it's not cool, but for you power freaks out there, you have the power to prevent a jet from flying yeah if, if it's too high you can say oh you can't fly that jet or whatever yeah now the thing that comes with that is a lot of people are going to be mad at you and they're going to say you don't know what you're doing so yeah. you're going to have to prove and you're going to have to do it over and over again and show these people that it's reading high in titanium yeah. and that it doesn't need to fly and uh it's kind of tedious because you can you have to use gloves when you do it. Mm -hmm. If you touch your face or your gloves aren't clean, you you need to put alcohol on your gloves or whatever. You can cause the readings to be off because you have dirt on. Yeah. Your, if you don't change the electrode or the little wheel thing, if you don't clean the machine good enough, it'll have it'll cause false readings. So. Dang. Yeah. So my last question for you after you just explained what you do in your job is what would advice be that you could give to anybody that's going to have your job possibly or they're looking into NDI? What would advice be for somebody that's going to get themselves into this type of career field? I would tell you the biggest thing is I saw a lot of people get in trouble because NDI is, is one of those jobs depending upon your base that you can go in there and you can do absolutely nothing. Like, you go, you walk in there and you see staff sergeants and you see senior airmen. Not doing it. That's not doing it. Just sitting around. NDI, not doing it. Not no. doing it. No dirt yeah. involved. And yeah. everybody's <laughs> playing ping pong and watching TV and shooting pool. Yeah, we have TVs in NDI labs that we can yeah. watch. We have pool table. We have ping pong. All that fun stuff. You guys had made it. Tindall, man. Yeah, we did. <laughs> um, and so you think, hey, I can go join in on the fun too. And it's like you're the little guy on the totem pole, so you have to like look busy and find stuff to do, study your CDCs, and just make it look like you're doing something because you haven't earned the right to do nothing yet. So just keep that in mind. Like, Don't fall into the trap. Like, Just stay focused because you can't get in trouble by not doing nothing, although there's nothing to do. So... <laughs> Yeah. So, so just work hard, basically, even when you first start out until you kind of figured out how things go. Yeah. Okay. They want to make sure that you know how to do your job. So, which is kind of important in the Air Force. Which is which you probably know how to do your job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when everybody else is shooting pool or playing ping pong, just go study your CDCs. Or, and once you get out of your CDCs and you're like, there's no jobs to do, 
go practice. You can you can set up NDI. You can set up like uh, simulation, like Eddy Current and mm -hmm. stuff, or Magna Part. You can practice, and you can do. They they like to see that kind of stuff. All right. Well, we hope you guys appreciated this video of Jay talking about his job, non destructive inspection in the Air Force. If you guys are interested in this job, or you know anybody that might be. Go ahead and share this video with them and maybe it'll be helpful. Uh, also, let your recruiter know possibly that we're making videos interviewing people about different career fields. So if they want to send people this way and get information about the different career fields in the Air Force directly from airmen, this is a great way to do it. 